working. So, all right, ladies, this is Miss uh, Doris Trepto, and she's going to introduce herself and tell you the wonderful things she does. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, everybody. Um, Doris Trepto Kovacs. I am a professor in the fashion department at the Savannah College of Art and Design. I just completed my 15th year, like, uh, I had it around here. They gave me like a little pin for like 15 years uh, with the college. So that was pretty cool. And um, I'm adjusting as everybody else is, right? New situation. And uh, prior to coming to SCAD, I used to teach fashion back in Brazil. That's my home country. So I've been in the States for uh, 20, so 17 years and 15 years teaching with SCAD. Mm, I guess that's it. Well, well what else? Oh. oh, I have a book published in Brazil that's called Inventando Moda. That means inventing fashion, and it's like an intro to fashion uh, textbook. All right. So, ladies, what questions do you have for um, Doris? Um, I can go first. Okay. So just for individual, like, people, what do you think, or and maybe in your own life, like, as a consumer, what do you think are the best things that you can do personally to, like, contribute to a more sustainable fashion industry? Okay. Mahika, tell, tell me a, a bit about you, too. Like, where oh, are yeah. you okay. and, like, how, how old yeah. are you? Okay, yeah. I'm 17. Okay. I'm in California. All right. Oh, it's yeah. early there. Yeah, it is really early, but I'm, like, really interested in this topic, so okay. <laughs> I set my alarm for 6.30, well, well, and I was like... <laughs> well, you you know what? I was up at 6, because uh, I think originally I had planned this to be for, like, 7 a.m. my time, uh-huh. because I thought, like, okay, I can do this before my daughter wakes up, <laughs> and then I'm in the meeting at 7 a.m. my time. And, and then I'm looking at the drop-off. It's like, well, these people in California, that's going to be like 3 a.m. for them. That's nuts. And then I saw, you know, the two uh, uh, UTC time. It's like, okay, uh, I, I am just three hours too early. <laughs> <laughs> Doris, you know what? I've been struggling because in Mexico, we still haven't changed. Um, for daylight savings. For daylight savings. So last mm. week, I was going to be in a meeting. And I was late for like 40 minutes because in my country, we're still an hour, I don't know, ahead, behind, what, like, the, and yeah. so this morning, I woke up and I'm like, oh my God, I think I'm going to be late. <laughs> That's why I woke up earlier because in my time, this would have started at 9 a.m., but it's 8 a.m. here okay. in Mexico, you know, and so I'm like, oh my God, like, I keep asking, well, whatever, I'm here, I didn't, I, I made it. <laughs> okay, okay, so it's 8 for you, it's 7 for you, Mahika? Okay, please repeat your question. Okay, yeah. So as consumers in this industry, what's the best thing that you can do from like an individual perspective to contribute to a more sustainable industry? I would say as consumers to be mindful, be mindful of, you know, what are you buying and how much you're buying of it. Uh, if you look at the you know, numbers of consumption pattern, you know, we are consuming, you know, uh, a multiple of what our parents' generation did consume, and and they consume more than their parents. So it's, it just has been exponential. You know, we are building bigger houses because we need bigger closets just to accumulate stuff. Mm. No. And then we buy things and we only, you know, wear them a few times. I, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, uh, apparel uh, and accessories in general. You don't use them as much. You no, know, I remember my grandmother had this like one red uh, wool coat that was almost, you know, it was like her trademark. She was like the lady with the red coat because she wore that so often. Okay. And our perception these days is like, God forbid you get associated with something that you wear because, you know, uh, um, advertising pushes you to keep changing, keep changing, keep changing. 
uh, that's the first thing we're realizing with this, with this crisis is that, hey, wait a second, we don't need to keep changing. You know, you can wear your, your things longer. So I think being mindful of how much we are consuming is the first thing. And then the second one is like, what are we consuming? You know, like, where is it coming from? How, how is it being made? What is it being made of? But to me, the first one is, is definitely the quantity. Ladies, Next. anybody else? <laughs> um, yeah, I had a question. Um, I'm really interested in, like, thrifting and reusing fashion. Yes. And so um, I was wondering if thrifting is a realistic way of becoming a more sustainable consumer. Um, Elia, you know you, sorry. Uh, uh, how, do, how do I pronounce your name? Um, my name is Elia. Um, Elia. I live in um, Los Angeles, California. Okay. Okay, uh, Elia, I'm also very interested in, in thrifting, uh, the, the piece that I'm wearing, mm -hmm. it's kind of thrifted from my mom's closet, <laughs> so you know, it, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's not really a hand-me-down, hand it was like, it's like, I took it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I do some thrifting. I do some, uh, I, I did the Rent the Runway, mm. the, the, the subscription. And uh, it, it's something that interests me. Now, in terms of how significant of an impact that it can do for sustainability, I guess there are two things to be considered. One of them is why are you thrifting, right? Are you thrifting because, you know, you find cool things that are, uh, you know, by nature, they're limited now because it's not like, oh, your friend sees what you have and like, oh, I like that. I'm going to get the same thing because there is not normally, you know, the same thing when, when you go thrifting. Mm -hmm. Um, if you, if you're interested because of like, you know, that great style find something that is different, that you can make it your own. That's one thing. If you're interested in thrifting because you're thrifting from charity stores and you're interested in, you know, helping with, you know, wh whatever charity it is. Okay. But if you're just thrifting because, hey, I'm getting a good deal out of this, then there's something wrong with the mindset. Mm -hmm. No. So if you're just thrifting to pay less for something, you know, we need to we need to rethink the value of 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 clothing. We need to rethink the value of items. You know, if you buy something, I don't care it is if it is from thrifting or if it is you know from a, a fast fashion retailer, and you think it's great that oh I got this for four ninety nine. <clears throat> Nothing comes for free. Someone paid for it. Mm. You know, so like if an item that would normally cost, let's say, forty nine, you pay four ninety nine, someone paid along the way. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, that's so interesting. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. I thought as the, the, like that, so it's better. What I would say. So like you're buying stuff on Depop or. Um, in things like that, uh, what is interesting is the competition that is going to generate with you know fast fashion brands, with you know brands that are selling the brand new stuff. Um, there's just an article, was it today or yesterday, on the on the business of fashion, saying that uh, Zara and H and M they are halting production. Because of the drop in demand. Wow. So like it, this is basic economy. As long as there is demand, brands are going to produce. Brands are going to overproduce. Okay. As long as there is demand. 
the moment that you shift your dollars from shopping at a fast fashion retailer or like any retailer, the moment that, that, that you shift from shopping a brand new item to buy a secondhand item, you are motivating the halt of that production. Mm -hmm. I, Doris, can I ask you, did they explain what was the, um, the change in, in consumers? Like, was it... Um, well, the thing with consumers right now is that they are not going out. So, okay, like so everybody's yeah. reporting at least 25% drop. Okay, so I was wondering um, if it was and, connected. And, and quite frankly, you know, people are more interested in buying toilet paper than a new pair of jeans. Oh yeah, I know. I still don't understand the toilet paper thing. Um, yeah, okay. I was wondering because in my, yeah. Imagine life without it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. No, I understand that, but... <laughs> hoarding it you know like getting yes. going to costco and just buying like 10 packages of toilet paper it's like people come on you know i know I, I i went to sam's club last week and there was not a single row to be found wow okay Mikey, can you yeah. have a question My okay i have uh, so many questions for you um, so do you think that when people spend more money on something, so like for me, when I got my first paycheck, I bought this like $200 jumpsuit and it was my entire paycheck, but I really wanted it. It was from Aritzia and I just had, first of all, I had like buyer's guilt and I never wore it be and it was just sitting in my closet because it's like, this is for special occasions because I spent so much money on it. So my first question is when people spend more, like, do they... Do you think that it actually makes them like find value in their items or sometimes when you have a thrift thing, then like, you're like, you get more use out of it because you're like, okay, I spent like $4 on this. So like if I you know get it dirty or something, then you almost like don't take care of it as much, but you also like get more wear out of it. And then also for you personally, are there certain materials? So for me, like with polyester or um, like the material that Aritzia uses in some of their jumpsuits is like really thin. So it, it um, looks wrinkled easily, so it doesn't like look as put together, and it also like doesn't last as long. So, are there ma specific materials that you like to buy because you feel like they last more um, and like they look more new for a longer period of time, so you don't f find yourself buying as much stuff um, as much? Okay, uh, as far as the materials, Mahika, uh, I'm not gonna tell how old I am, but in the nineties I was uh, I was in the industry. I was like literally factory floor and I worked at a company that they bought cotton um, yarn and they needed their own jerseys and then we made sweatshirts, t shirts, you name it. Okay. Um, you can make something poorly made that's not gonna last out of a great material like organic cotton. Mm -hmm. okay. You can make an excellent, durable fabric out of anything if you make the fabric right. Okay. And if you take care of it properly. I mean, it is insane to think that the average person doesn't even look at uh, you know care instructions. They don't even know what those icons are on the tags, and we just dump everything in the washer, and you know we wash it hot, which reduces the life of, of the fabrics. I mean, if you have something with spandex, for example, and you start washing it hot, which is something that you know guilty as charged, we all have done probably. Right, so like let's say it's summer, you went to the pool, um, you come back, you have you know, your towels, you have your bathing suit, you just throw everything in the washer, and you know, you want to wash towels, uh, maybe you want to do the hot cycle. What are you doing? You're melting away the spandex out of your bathing suit. Then a couple months later, your bathing suit starts feeling a little like loose and like doesn't stretch as well, and, and you know. You, you didn't lose weight. It's your bathing suit that doesn't expand that, or, you know, it doesn't retract back after it's expanded, right? So the care of the fabrics is one thing. 
okay, and good quality fabrics. So it doesn't really matter what the fabric is made of, but how the fabric is made. Okay? I remember one of the things in this company, um, they, they were known... They were known in their market for, you know, good quality, you know, cotton jerseys and fleece. And we could take their t-shirts and we could wash them a thousand times. I, I, I mean, this was like a couple decades ago and I still have, I still have things that, that I produce for that company. Okay. Um, When it was election season, they would also make some like uh, election campaign T-shirts, right? So like the T-shirt with the name of the candidate, the number, and that was an item that, hey, this is to be worn this like four months before the election, and then people are never going to wear it again. Then what they would do, they would, um, when you set up the machine, for knitting, you can adjust the settings, right? So they would adjust it in such way that would use less yarn. So it's almost like, you know, you create a jersey that is more open, mm -hmm. right? We, we used to call them um, calendar shirts. Like, you know, like the calendar to use, like, to drain pasta. Mm -hmm. Okay. Be because the fabric was spread so thin that, you know, it was just enough to make the garment. Okay. What happens over time? You start washing that garment. I don't know if it, if it ever happened to uh, any of your, like, jersey items that the side seams starts twisting. So, like, when you put on the body, you know, the, the side seam kind of, like, goes, like, spiral around mm -hmm. you. Have you ever experienced that with an item? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what that is? The fabric wasn't done properly. It wasn't stabilized. Now I can make, I can make that same Jersey that, you know, has been lasting for over 20 years now. And I can make that calendar Jersey out of the same yarn. So it's, you know, where is the industry cutting corners? Of course, that calendar jersey, because it used less yarn, they could charge less for it. Mm. It's less material, but it was less quality. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So there is no recipe, you know, that uh, when people say like, oh, like everybody, let's go buy only organic cotton. Yes. Okay, H&M, I think, it, uh, um, it uses like one-third of all the, the organic cotton in the world. Okay, it's being used to produce H&M products. Okay. But if they're making that jersey, you know, very thin, what's going to happen? You're going to wash it two times. It's going to start spiraling around, right? Uh, maybe it's going to start having no peeling if it, it wasn't treated properly. So, like, what a waste, of organic cotton mm. or you're making that trendy item that you know two weeks from now oh it's out then nobody wants it so you know what's what's the point of having something that nobody wants it did i answer your question i think i, I went on like rambling. Yeah, definitely i was expecting you to just be like okay so only buy like this fabric and this fabric but it's really um, I've never heard that before. Of like, I, you know, I wish it was that easy. Like look on the to make sure that we're buying only. Yeah. Um, do you like when you are buying something in a store? Do you look for like the seams and the like? Are there things that you look for that you can visually tell as somebody that's worked in construction of garments, like? that you, you can tell just by looking at it? Or do you have to, like, look at the dry clean only, like, hand wash cold to see? Or, like, what do you look for? Uh, quite frankly, not a lot. I, 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 I don't necessarily practice, you know, everything. I, I, I'm still, you know, I, I come from a fashion background. I am motivated by aesthetics. Like, okay, do I like it? It's, the, it's my first. Because you might have the, the, the thing that is, uh, 
you know, it was properly made, it is uh, organic, or it's recycled, or biodegradable, you, you name it. It can have, like, all the sustainable qualities. If it is something that I don't see myself wearing, I'm not going to buy it. You know, we, we buy things because we like them. So that that aesthetic connection, I think, is, is, is still what comes first. I do look at the tag, and normally if an item is dry clean only, I don't get it. Okay. And quite honestly, that had nothing to do with sustainability. It's more because dry cleaning is pretty expensive where I live, and I go like, ah, it's not going to happen. Um, Veronica, so we haven't heard from you. <laughs> Actually, I have a question. So I'm Veronica. I live in Singapore. Okay. Um, so you mentioned something about kind of the 90s and just I have a question around that. Um, do you think that maybe the cost for clothing at the moment is at a reasonable price for from its resources like the materials being used to create it or that maybe it's increased maybe a drastic amount over the time period since the 90s or back then? Uh, quite the opposite. It has decreased. If you look at the price of everything, if you look at a price of, you know, a gallon of milk comparing from the 90s to now, if you look at the price of education, the price of rent, everything has gone up. If you look at the price of a pair of jeans compared to, you know, 20, uh, um, 20 years ago to now, it has for the same quality. It has probably decreased. Okay. Now, there is a good reason for that and there is a bad reason for that. The good reason is that we became smarter as far as producing in terms of technology. And so like the, te the technology that we are using to produce or, you know, the way that is being produced, um, time management in production and stuff like that, we are producing at a lower cost, okay, because we can, we can make the manufacturing better. Okay. What is the bad side is also in the production because I'm talking of items of the same quality. Okay. I'm not even going back to that cutting corners on the making of the fabric. Um, the bad side is the people because you know, we are paying less and less for the manufacturing. And how does that happen is from production jumping from one country to the other. It's like wherever is the cheapest place to produce. Oh. Now, oh, it was cheaper for a while. It was cheaper to produce in Los Angeles than in New York. Then Los Angeles, oh, it's expensive too. It's easier. It's cheaper to produce in Mexico. And then we go and we produce in Mexico. And now, oh, it's easier to produce in Bangladesh. So, you know, Bangladesh is producing, right? And it's not that they are producing with more technology, that they are producing either, you know, faster or, or, or any, any way. It's because people get paid less. And that is like a very, very dark side of fashion is the way that it, it exploits people. So if you compare for the same quality item, Today, the price is lower, with one exception, which is luxury fashion. Luxury fashion has gone up and up and up, and that is because of market. It, okay, it's because people agree to pay that price. Let me put you on the mindset of a luxury fashion brand. If it costs me $50, or you know, fifty dollars, I wouldn't be paying people right. So let's say it cost me five hundred dollars to produce, you know, a handmade handbag in Italy. They think think of like the Kelly bag, but 
consumers are willing to pay up to $10,000 on that bag. Why am I going to sell it for $2,000? It costed me $500 to produce. If I sold it for $2,000, I'm making you know, four times the cost. It would be fair enough, don't you think? But if the market agrees to pay $10,000, why won't I price it at $10,000? And guess what happens with the Kelly bag? There's a wait list for it. So luxury has to keep going up because people just agree to do it. They are going to be the ones hurting the most with this crisis. When Louis Vuitton opened the store here in Monterrey, where I live, uh, for many years, it was the highest selling store in Latin America. And it had a wait list. It was yep. insane. Like... Yeah, it had like a two-year wait list on items. Yeah, because it was a status item, you know. Mm -hmm. Like you, you, probably the people that bought them didn't do like Mahika that oh bought and uh, oh I'm gonna save this for special occasions, right? <laughs> they bought to show off. They bought to show that I, I can have it. You know, I can afford it. Like I'm better than you. Yeah, I live in a. I live in San Pedro, and San Pedro is a county in Monterrey that is very high-end, and um, yeah, a lot of uh, wealthy families live here in San Pedro, and so it's a status thing to have, yeah. it was a status thing to have a bag by Louis Vuitton that you bought at that particular store, you know, it was just, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it, it's not just the bag, you know, it's the story that comes with it, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you bought there and stuff. You know, that, that's also, you know, that also creates the market for counterfeits. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There are some products that have such a hype around them. It's like a Supreme t-shirt. There's nothing more basic than that. You know, a black t-shirt with a red and white print on it. I mean, I can, I can do one in my garage. <laughs> no. But people wear that damn Supreme shirt with such pride. It's like, I'm Supreme. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oops, Veronica, you're not smiling. You have a Supreme shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you think about, you know, fashion is a social construct. There is nothing luxurious about the t-shirt. And yet, you know, we pose as we are better than others because we are carrying our Supremes instead of a gap. No, it's just a social construct. And, and it's funny because, you know, in women... Uh, in the women's market, women will measure each other by the handbags that they're carrying, right? So, like, I, I, I see the Louis Vuitton, you know, thing. And that's in all levels, you know. It's not just uh, uh, high luxury, but mid-market as well. Um, if you think that, you know, probably around two-thirds of the, of the revenue from Michael Kors comes from the sales of handbags. Okay, the perfume and the apparel is just like one third of the business. Okay. And what is about that bag? You know, it has the, like the gaudy, big MK, you know, gold, bigger than ba the better so people can see the logo that hey, you have, you know, that Michael Kors thing. Um, that bag is probably no no better than a Nine West bag, than uh, a gas bag. No, but there is a social construct around that bag that you know, makes all it so much better. You know? And if you start diluting that, then you fall in the trap that uh, Coach did. Coach used to be a status symbol brand for you know, upper middle class. 
uh, I guess they opened so many, you know, outlet and discount shops that it kind of diluted the bre- the, the value of the brand in consumers' perspection, per- perception, right? Mm. It hasn't happened to Louis Vuitton yet. Well, they're not at the outlet stores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of brands are pulling out of the outlet stores. Um, Ralph Lauren has significantly reduced their emphasis on on discount merchandise because mm. you, you you guys know the you know the dirty secret about the the outlets, right? It's not the same product. It's not the same product that that you buy. Uh, Oh, you're making me hungry, Mahika. <laughs> <laughs> I have class at eight. Okay. okay. Online class because we're all online now. So I don't have a break in between and then I have class until 11. So to eat now. And enjoy, enjoy. <laughs> uh, but I was sharing with you about the, the outlet shops. If you go to Banana Republic outlet, for example, Look at the tag of the items. You now you come into the store; it looks like a regular store. You know, it's cute. You have like a complete assortment, like all sizes of things, right? And they're like color coordinated. They're like literally mini collections in there. You look at the tag of those items. The tag says Banana Republic Factory Store. That item has never seen the light of day at a Banana Republic regular store it was made to be sold in the outlet it was made with that like calendar jersey well not talking bad about you know banana republic but it is a different quality no and then they put like oh suggested retail or no um they put on the price tag something like you know uh, 89 and then our price uh 39 that item was never sold for 89 anywhere. <laughs> it was made to be sold at 39 with profit for the brand. With J Crew, on the J Crew outlet store, you find uh, the, the tag says J Crew, and then there's like three dots below the name J Crew. That's an outlet item. It was made to be sold at the outlet. It has never seen the light of day at the regular J. Crew store. Okay. You know what are the items in the outlet that were from the regular store? Normally the ones that are way in the back, in those racks where uh, normally the racks are like by size and you have like that hodgepodge of stuff, right? All mixed up. Mm-hmm. That is the leftover. That is the truly discount item. It's the things that didn't sell at the regular store and then they are transferred to the outlet. Mm -hmm. But the big business of outlet these days is those items that are produced for there. And you'll find the same design. You'll find the same like braided uh, leather belt that you saw at the Banana Republic catalog. You find it in the outlet, except that on the Banana Republic store, it's 100% leather, and in the outlet, it's synthetic. Hmm. So that they can sell it for cheap, for cheaper. I never knew that. Now yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, ladies, do you have other questions for Doris? No, I'm okay. Yeah. I have one more, just to bring um, more of a conversation on sustainability, because you were talking about, um, like, how Louis Vuitton is a status symbol and, like, just different designers have, like, a status symbol. Um, do you think that, like, the problem with sustainability – so there are a lot of options right now on, like, how you could buy sustainable clothes or ethical clothes. Like, Everlane is very transparent. Yes. So, um I don't know, like there's a lot of sustainable brands out there. They're, they come at a higher price point though. And so given the choice between like a $5 shirt and the $25 or $50 
handmade or ethically made shirt, a lot of people would just, like, go with the $5 shirt and get 10 of them. Yeah. So, like, what do you think we need to do for people to radically shift this mindset and see buying ethical, like, because it's not like a $50 shirt versus, like, people are willing to spend $500 or $1,000 on a bag or, like, a fancy bag. So, like, how do you get people to value sustainably made clothes in the same way that they do, like, a designer piece? I don't know if I have an answer for you. Okay, I think that uh, knowledge is... Knowledge is bliss and it's also a curse right? because there are things that you can't unsee, right? Or you can't, um, you can't do with a clear conscience once you know about it. And the reaction of most of the people is like, I don't want to know. Don't tell me, don't tell me about it because like, you know, if I don't know, I'm not going to feel guilty. Right, and then you know, take might have to take some like dramatic measures or decide that hey, this is not for me. You know, I adopted one thing like H and M has two stores in in my area here, and I've been in the in their outlet. They have the store at an outlet here. It's not an outlet H and M. But it's an H&M store located in the outlet. And I've been in that store because I had guests from out of town and they wanted to go there. The H&M, oh no, it's third. So they have the outlet, they have one downtown and they have one in the mall. Those other two, the one in the mall and the one downtown, I never set foot in it. Okay, Because I know if I go in, you know, there's going to be a pair of earrings calling my name. Yeah, and I like that. So it, it it's kind of like you know. Sorry for the bad comparison, but it's like, kind of like alcoholism. You know, if you have a problem, if you can't contain your drinking, don't go to a bar. Start with that. You know, I like fashion. You know, I like cute things. I don't go to fast fashion retailers because I know I'll be tempted. Mm. Yeah. It works for me. I don't think it's going to work for everybody. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Any final questions? Something that came up? Are we okay? Yeah. No, let, me, let me just take a look at the ones that we had in the... Oh, yeah, in the chat. Um, in, in the, the sign-up sheet. Just to make sure that we cover... What shift do you think need to occur for consumers and producers of fashion to make the multi-billion dollar more sustainable? Um, definitely consumption. It, it starts with consumers. The industry is going to mold itself to you know what consumers demand or not. And we're already seeing that. Uh, um, what questions should individual people ask themselves before buying new clothes, because it's a great question: Is do I need this, or you know, do I do I want this as bad that you know I need to have it? Okay, I think everybody knows the Patagonia case that uh, they did an ad saying, "Don't buy this clothes, don't buy this shirt, or this jacket," right? And it was like, "Don't buy this jacket if you don't need it." Hmm. I know. Okay. Can you yeah, that was more? that was an ad that they. This is the outdoor sea like jacket yeah. outdoor wear brand, right? Yes, and they published that ad on the New York Times. Was like a full page ad uh, on Black Friday. I don't remember how many years ago, but I, I mean, it was so unconventional. It was like, don't buy this jacket. So like, try to refrain. You know, from from shopping, um, and then whatever you buy, enjoy it, wear it, take good care of it. Okay, I have I have two sets of china here in my house. None of them are mine. 
One is my husband's uh, mother, and one is his grandmother's. So essentially, I inherited those two sets of china. Okay, uh, I use them. I know they, they probably didn't. I know they probably had that, you know, just for the, the special occasions. Okay, no, I'm not using them every day, but I'm enjoying them. Because that jumper that you bought, guess what? Five years from now, you might look at it and say, like, what was I thinking? Because fashion changed. So, you know, enjoy it. Wear it and take good care so that you can wear it more times. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, um, thank you, Doris, so much. And thank you, Veronica, Mahika, and Elia um, for your time. And all right, I'll see you guys around. Thank you. OK. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Stay healthy. You too.